Hey, Linda. Hey, Louise. What's wrong? Well, I love podcasts, but I need a new one. Do you know if there are any where two sweetie sisters talk about movies from the 80s and 90s that shape their childhood existence, and also that have a cat that makes a ruckus in the background? Do I? Let me tell you a podcast I started listening to called Large Marge Sent Us. Two sisters break down classic 80s and 90s movies like The Princess Bride, Never Ending Story, and Pee Wee's Big Adventure. They even did a whole month dedicated to Fred Savage flicks. Wow, I love Fred Savage. Where can I get this magical podcast? You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or Google Play. You can also follow them on Twitter at The Sweetie Club. And don't forget to tell them, Large Marge sent you to this podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Not Fade Away podcast. We are the show that talks about folks in the music world who are no longer with us. This episode is a follow-up to the John Belushi one that dropped last week. I wanted to give you all a chance to listen to my full chat with Kate Ruby Klempfner. Say hi again, Kate. Hi, my name is Kate Ruby Kletner, and John Belushi was my godfather. Kate gave me so much great information and fun gossip talking about her father, music executive Michael Klempfner, John Belushi, and Dan Aykroyd. So I wanted you all to hear the full interview she gave me. I want to personally thank Kate once again for being so candid and honest with me, and ultimately to the whole world. In this interview, we mentioned her father's scene in the Blues Brothers, so just for reference, I'm playing that clip again one more time. Here we go. God, the mafia's after you. guys him. were hot. You were great and saying, I've got to record you. Bullshit. Bullshit? I don't bullshit. I'm president of Clarion Records, the largest recording company on the Eastern Seaboard. So what? Here's $10,000 in advance on your first recording session. Is it a deal? Yeah, sure it's a deal. Sure, sure, it's a deal. Uh, listen, all these cops out here, they're sort of waiting for us. We gotta get out of here without nobody seeing us. You know a back door out of this place? Sure. I used to be head bouncer here back in the 70s. There's an electrical service duct right behind your drummer's riser. Listen, do us a favor. Take $1,400, give it to Ray's Music Exchange in Calumet City. Give the rest of the band. You got it. Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs> Also in this interview, we talk about John, Dan, Aretha Franklin, old Saturday Night Live gossip, and even a Chris Farley story. It's a little on the rough side sometimes, but I kind of like that since most of my shows are uber produced and polished. If you like what you hear today, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review if you have the time. Follow us on social media at Not Fadeaway Podcast and me personally at Brooklyn Fit Chick on all social media. Thanks so much. Now let's have the full interview with Kate Ruby Klempner. <laughs> My father worked in the music business. He started working at the Fillmore East as an out, like outside security man, and then eventually wound up working with Clive Davis. And he was, I, I don't know how he met, I know he met John and Dan through uh, Saturday Night Live. I, I mean, I remember as a child even spending a lot of time at Saturday Night Live. You know, like, I, I, I mean... You know, not having a real concept of what it was. I remember being there, and I know when I was a baby and my dad had to work there, he would put me on stage, and they would point all the cameras towards me so that he could walk around and work. And they would put a little blues, they would put, a, you know, a, you know, sunglasses like Ray-Bans on me and a little uh, soul patch, and I'd be the blues baby. That Or that is, I mean, I don't remember, but that was how it was related to me. So my dad was then working at, at Arista, and Clive Dave, it was Clive Davis's Arista, or Arista, 
and he saw he had a, was doing a Saturday Night Live album. You know that was, and so my dad was he, he sort of worked on like the the young cool projects. You know, my dad was sort of the liaison to the kids kind of thing. You know, then like you know non corporate music business guy. John and Dan really loved the blues, and John was from Chicago. My dad heard them perform, and they sort of, and then he conceived of it as an act. Had and he asked to put out a very, the very successful, oh no, Atlantic. I'm sorry, put out a very successful Blues Brothers album that you know, which and the movie, and they wrote my dad into the movie because he got them signed. So in the movie, if you're familiar at all with it, there's the part where uh, they're on stage at the big concert. Looks like escape is impossible, and they're sneaking off stage, and they go backstage, and right before are about to go, this big guy grabs them and says, "You know, you guys were terrific. I, you know, I got to record you." And he, you know, gives them the money they need, and then they go on. And but it's you know a bit part. No, but and, it's a great part. Are you kidding me? I love. It's one of my favorites. Yes, he plays like you know, sort of little, you know, the angel out of nowhere. Yeah. It's, it's it's great because he shows up in the seed and it's just like he's giving exposition. It's the only reason he's there. Do you know what I mean? And oh. they do that in movies, and the, but they make it so obvious that it's hilarious. Like because they have to go from the stage out of the building. So how do we make that happen? <laughs> right, because he was like, I was head bouncer back here in the seventies, and um, you know they wrote that in because he had actually been a bouncer. So the you know it was pretty. You know you can see at the end of the scene he sort of goes. Whew, like, you can see him exhale because he was, you know, his voice didn't even sound like my his voice. He was so <laughs> nervous. And um, apparently they made him costume designer was uh, the director's wife or girlfriend or something. And made the, the suit they made him wear. My father was a very well-dressed man. Like, he was, you know, I wouldn't say metrosexual. I would just say, you know, or he was, he was stylish. Like, he was... It, you know, even though, you know, may have been overweight, but well-dressed. Sure. And they, it was a really tacky suit. And it was a really tacky suit, like a three-piece polyester thing. And my dad, who didn't do anything that anyone ever wanted him to do, he was forced to wear that suit. And they said, oh, well, it, you know, it's what a record, you know, a record guy would wear. He's like, I am a record guy. <laughs> and so he wound up giving that suit to the doorman at the Beverly Hills Hotel, who <laughs> Because uh, they were about the same size. That is fantastic. So um, let me direct you to what are your um, early memories? I mean, I guess how old were you when he passed away? Do you mind me asking? Um, I, I mean, at under five years old. Okay, but um, you remember him? Yes, I mean, my parents. My he, you know, my father was my father was a pallbearer at his funeral. They were very good friends. You know, John and Dan were my godparent, my godfathers. You know, and that's, I I know that, you know, John has this reputation of being a real, you know, the partier and drug addict and whatnot. But, you know, it's not like my mom would have, you know, let him be my godfather if that was the case. He really wasn't that until the end. You know, he's wild and crazy, but no more, I think, than anyone else at the time. And I know from what my parents had told me that, uh, he took that he took the role as godfather very seriously like i very much remember being at their house in on west 9th street in new york i and uh, also in martha's vineyard him and his wife judy who uh, i still keep in touch with oh really and, yeah um she's just, she's super cool and sweet they were high school sweethearts yeah so yeah i mean i have you know it's like the time of your life when you only remember like your my memories are all of people's needs, you know, cause I was yeah. like so little. But I remember, you know, my that he was very, really nice to me, and I, you know, I wasn't scared of him. Like there's no, there was no like, and that he was really funny. And my, I, my uh, most vivid memory was we were having uh, my parents were having some sort of dinner party, and uh, they had these wicker chairs. Or now it's some sort of you know, straw thing. I don't know what rattan. I don't know what they call it. Mm -hmm. John comes back into the into the dining room, sits down in the chair, and literally busts through the straw. And it was so funny. I mean, 
like, I mean, what was I, three? And I was laughing just as hard as the adults. It was just the funniest thing, and he played it up. And I think my dad hung the chair up on, the broken chair up on the wall. You know, I mean, he was, uh, yeah, I mean, he was, he was aware. My dad was always very appreciative of how cool it was, those kind of things were. Yeah, so, I mean, I remember playing with him on the beach, uh, you know, but I didn't have a lot of, understanding about what was going on then obviously you know when he died my parents told me that it was because he didn't take he hadn't taken good care of himself which is you know a fair enough thing to tell a you know a four-year-old kid when and it's actually in judy belushi's book that you know that she asked me if i knew why john died and i said yes it was because he didn't eat his vegetables and he didn't brush his teeth or something like, you know, something to that effect, because, you know, if you didn't take good care of yourself at four years old, that's, you know, what that's what it translates to. So, yeah, I mean, I just, and then I, I mean, I remember spending a, a fair amount of time with them. I mean, I went to Martha's Vineyard with them more than once. And again, I remember being at Saturday Night Live a lot. My dad was the first to take John to the 10th Street Baths. And my dad, my dad used to take me when I was a little kid also. <laughs> So, I mean, my dad, like, I, he took me to Studio 54 once when I was, oh. a baby. I know, so I'm like, it's, uh, I've been, like, I had a really cool life before I was five. That's, that's incredible. So can I ask you a question mm-hmm. about Wired? Do you remember this book coming out? Yes. Okay. And what did your father think of it? Your dad's well, no longer with us, by the way. I'm very sorry to hear that. That's okay. I, uh, you know, the, he, He's having fun up there. I yeah. Think. He's probably um, hanging out with my dad, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I um, it, it, I know that he's okay. Um, the book Wired, so, you know, obviously Bob Woodward, you know, it's, it, he was, he's a reputable author. He came, you know, and it was going to be, you know, he sold it as a different story. You know, a, a real story of, of John as a man and an actor and who he was as a person, not the persona because he was so completely famous at the time. Whereas Danny was, Dan is, you know, unrecog- he can walk down the street and not be recognized. Still, you know, still in f- my father was in an elevator with Dan Aykroyd once and someone recognized and the, with Dan Aykroyd and one other guy, a stranger and the stranger recognized my father from the blues brothers movie. He <laughs> and standing next to Dan Aykroyd. Right. That's how one, but John couldn't go outside. Like he, you know, he had to wear disguises and things like that. And, you know, this wired was really supposed to be telling the, the not, you know, sort of rock and roll wasteland version of it, you know, of, of John's real life. You know, he was class president or, you know, in his high, of his high school, right. Captain of the football team. Uh, I think is a better act. It doesn't always, you know, should, there were other opportunities he should have taken. Um, my father once told me that uh, a project he tried to get John to do was they were writing uh, this P.T. Barnum story, you know, the biogra- biography. Yeah. And, that, you know, so I think he just, you know, he didn't, uh, you know, a little undersold. But so they, you know, it, 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 his talent, I think, fell victim to this sort of drug overdose death. And everyone was willing to cooperate and give interviews for Wired because they thought they would be sort of, you know, not clearing his name, but telling the true story. And, um, that's, and then it really came, and when it came out, it was not, you know, at all, you know, painted as a very dark picture. I remember my father being very upset with it. I mean, it's not, you know, very upset. Just that it had nothing, you know, it, and I, you know, I, I know I mentioned it in a, a couple times, but, um, I know my mom is upset. You know, she, she, when I asked her about John, you know, just, I wanted to talk to her a little bit about him before this interview, she was like, we were duped. You know, that's why I, Judy went and wrote her book, which was called Samurai Widow. It's actually very good. So, because yeah. he, you know, John did the samurai, you know, delicatessen, the samurai character on the early Saturday Night Lives. So, 
the, the feeling I get is that he was basically like a recreational like pot smoker and did like to drink, but it's maybe the last year, year and a half of his life that he kind of went down this bad path. And it sort of like presented like he was a heavy partier for like 10 or 15 years. And I don't think that's the case at all. That's just my research. And I don't know what you heard, but I yeah, feel he, like, you know, like you're, why was everyone so upset? Because if I remember reading Wired, I'm like, oh my God, this guy was a maniac. He was an animal. And then, but every person who knew him said, no, he was actually very gentle. You know, he was very, he was complex as a human being, but he wasn't this raging, you know, party animal. No, I mean, it was the seventies. I mean, I, you know, every, every, he, but he wasn't a party animal, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's, it was only the last, you know, you, you're spot on with your, with your take. Um, he was very much a, you know, I asked my, my dad once, uh, right, a few years before he died, we actually, the Blues Brothers was on TV, and we watched it together, and so I got to ask him all the questions that I wanted to ask him going through the movie, and uh, I... You know, I was like, did John Belushi just get so many women? I was like, did he just get all the girls? And he was like, you know what? He's like, he was with Judy. He was like, Danny. He's like, Dan, it, it got all the women. Yeah, yeah, it makes total sense now that I think about it. So uh, what did... Uh, so you know, fame, fame, once he got super famous, that was, you know impossible for him you know that it was to get to that level of fame where you can't go outside that you're recognized even in disguise you know that's where he was yeah so, i mean and i think that that's it was so different than you know i mean like i said you know class president captain of the football team married his high school sweetheart you know i mean you know you do and a great actor yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, what? It, let's talk a little bit, just because this is a, a show about musicians and people associated with the music. Do you have anything to add about the? Because your dad, you know, basically he worked for the record company that signed them, correct? I'm just want to go. Yeah. yeah. So, did, do you have any impressions, your dad, about the music yeah. and performing? My dad signed them. You know, he, you know, the record company didn't. You know, he, my dad signed them. He got them signed. You know, to Atlantic. You know, he saw the the potential as an act, and then they put together the you know the band, which was uh, you know was the most dangerous rock band in rock and roll or something, or the the world's most dangerous band or something. And it was Paul Schaefer and Donald Duck Dunn, and you know, I mean, if you look at, I mean, it's really like member for member, the one of the greatest bands, if not the greatest band ever put together. You know, it's like, I mean, if you look at who, who the people were in it. And uh, and then the movie, you know, so, I mean, the music, and my dad loved the music, but they were just having the times of their life. You know, the time it was just super fun for them. And then uh, they did the movie, and that's, I mean, my dad just said, you know, being, uh, you know, being there during uh, the Ray Charles scene and... You know, he said Aretha was Aretha was difficult. She wouldn't take a she won't fly. So uh, they had to, you know, what did she drive across country? Uh, that's she apparently she was good friends with Otis Redding, and Otis Redding was killed in a plane crash, and she was convinced it was uh, the mob that killed him. And they were going after music stars. I heard this a while ago. So she she's terrified of flying to this day. She takes a car, she takes a train, or a bus. Oh. Yeah, there you go. She do whatever she wants to. She's Aretha. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the album did incredibly well. I'm trying to, what, you know. What about, what, what about touring? Do you have anything about that? Like, because I know they went on tour to support the record. And, because they had, I think it's Briefcase Full of Blues Live or something. Yeah. yeah so, do, is there any, do you have any stories about that or? No, I don't, I mean, if they went on tour, I believe it was a limited tour. You know, it was like a, small promotional tour because they were doing Saturday Night Live. So, you know, that's a, a probably even more demanding schedule than I think, because they treated the, from what I remember being told, they treated the cast members really badly at the time. So not, you know, I don't have, I don't have any stories for that. That's okay. That's okay. No, no, you're giving me plenty. This is, this is all fantastic. <laughs> like, oh no. No, 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 
no, you're fantastic. Trust me. Nobody else is going to get stuff like this. So I'm, I'm thrilled. So can you just like for final thoughts, just like, you know, someone who's, let's say a millennial, they don't know John Belushi very well. Like what would you want them to know about him? And his, and his contribution to music. Oh, well, that's a really interesting question, I think. I think that his contribution to music, that I feel like he brought blues into the world of the frat boy. So that, you know, it became more uh, middle America. You know, it, became, it, was known, it became known through the movie became known through their album and through Saturday Night Live. People, you know, Sweet Home Chicago, no one really knew those songs. And I, you know, I remember we went, when I went to uh, Disney World with my parents sometime when I was a kid, we, you know, my dad, it was like the big trip and my dad pulled favors and we got these like, you know, got to go in the, before they had the flash passes. So we got a guided tour and go in the back entrance and whatever. And the, one of our tour guides at Disney World, in his frat, they had to watch, uh, they had a test on the Blues Brothers. And so they, he's like, I've watched that movie hundreds and hundreds of times. Like, in order to, you like, pass Rush, they had to answer questions about, about the Blues Brothers. So, I mean, I think that it's just like, that movie, you could never make a movie like that again. It would be, you know, it is... Every single, you know, it's like every great music, you know, legendary John Lee Hook, you know, John Lee Cab Calloway. And the, oh, here's a story was when they, they filmed that scene, the, the concert scene, you know, in the, in the Blues Brothers, that big scene. So they filled that hall by doing a, a radio contest, just a giveaway in the area. So the people who came, the audience members were just kids who won a con- you know, won tickets off the radio, had no idea what they were going to see and may or may not have been familiar with the Blues Brothers. And were definitely not familiar with Cab Calloway. And so what was amazing is that it was it was one take. I think it was the, you know, with the song when he goes Heidi 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 hi and they just answered it's like they didn't know that they were supposed to go Heidi 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 hi. You know, they'd never heard that before. Are you kidding me? No, it's the truth. Oh my god, that cuz I you know, this is my thing. I love the movie so much. I always say to myself that audience is the most enthusiastic audience that has ever seen a band ever. Like they're clapping yep. like so loud on the beat. It's all spontaneous. They didn't tell them to, they, you know, other than I think the, we want the show where they're chanting for, you know, the guys to come out. They didn't have any directions when they stood up and started dancing, you know, they, and you know, the show went on much longer than the recording of the filming, but you know, they hadn't heard anything like that. And same with me growing up, I would have never heard of Cab Calloway. It was how I, you know, started listening to Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles. I mean, Shake a Tail Feather is still one of my favorite songs, you know, and that version I think is probably, I can't think of a better version, to be honest, the Ray, you know, that Ray Charles Blues Brothers version. I, I totally agree with you. And it's my favorite dance sequence in a movie ever. Like that crowd dancing outside is just the most oh, joyful cool. thing. It really is. Um, John, I mean, other than him being essentially the the prototype that every overweight comedian on Saturday Night Live has based them, you know, you know, Chris Farley, Horatio Sands, just basically doing bad Belushi impersonations. <laughs> I mean, when at the second Woodstock, uh, Chris Farley was there, and they asked him to go up on stage. And he asked my dad, he goes, would Belushi do it? And my dad said, you wouldn't have been able to stop him. And so then Chris Farley went on stage and performed. A comedy or something, well, you know. You know, it would stay, you know, the Woodstock too. Every, it was one of the unhappy, one of the two unhappy Woodstocks. Was that 94? 
Yeah, it was not the violin one. No, it was the ninety four one. I was I was in I was in France at the time. Actually, it was the summer I graduated college, and I was going bumming around Europe. And I remember at a hotel room, like a two star hotel room in Paris, watching that, going, "I am so glad I'm not there." <laughs> well, we went. Um, I went with my parents and my sister in a trailer. Oh, I was sixteen. I met up with friends there. The the pace of moving at the, it was like waiting online the entire time. Like that was the pace you moved at. Ugh. And finally, I think my family, we, we, my mom, sister, and I like made my dad leave. Had it, it was nine inch nails came on, and we were like, it was enough. We were done. Like there was no more fun to be had. So <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, but what, what do you want the kids, uh, you know, the the young people out there who are not familiar with John Belushi, or people who have that very narrow opinion of John Belushi? He was this hard partier who just died. Like, just any lasting impressions you would like to give people about John Belushi? Maybe help change their perspective a bit. Okay. Well, I think that it's important. Do you know in any situation, in any hard partier situation, there's, a, you know, people are multifaceted. A, you know, that they're, you know, once the more you get to know about people, the more fascinating they are. And his contribution to comedy, he, sorry, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. It's okay. Take your time. I, I, I edit like crazy, so don't worry about ums and uhs and stuff like that. Or if I seem really quiet, I should have told you ahead of time. I'm losing my breath. Sorry. If, um, if I seem quiet, it's just because I'm really listening. Oh, okay. Um, no, I'm just, uh, he had that sort of, I was trying to think what they should take away from him and that is, I guess that. That's not where his glamour came from. That's where the downfall, that's what the downfall was. There was no good times for him. There weren't any good times in that party, you know, in the superficial world of, ooh, he got to go to the Playboy Mansion or Studio 54 or whatever, whatever. That, you know, that wasn't the time of his life. And in fact, was what ended his life and he could have gone on to do so much and really should have. So thank you, thank you so <laughs> much. I'm going I'm to hit stop record. Thank you for listening to the Not Fade Away podcast. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you love what you hear, yay, please leave a review. It helps us so much more than you could ever know. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Not Fade Away Podcast. You can email us with comments or suggestions to Not Fade Away Podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to learn more about my other shows, Book vs. Movie, The Fit Bottom Girls, and The Best Neighbors Podcast, just follow me at Brooklyn Fit Chick on all social media or check out my main blog, BrooklynFitChick.com. 